Well, uh, like I said, my name is Ryan Bird. I'm the Vice President of Engineering and the Chief Information Officer at Entrata. We have the annoying billboards, or some of the annoying billboards, which you've seen or not seen, I don't know, along I-15. Uh, and I, yes, this is a preposterous uh, opening slide. Um, but we do think, I, I think that, I'm also going to say bad things about XKCD, which I know might get me stoned, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and this is the reason why I, I titled my slide my slides this way because we think a lot of things that are just not true. Here's a list of things that we think that are just not true. You cannot see the Great Wall of China from the moon. Bulls are colorblind, so red does nothing to them. Um, anyway, you can eat and you can go swimming. It's perfectly fine. Your mother was wrong. Other things your mother is wrong about, incidentally, um, are things like if you don't bundle up, you will catch cold. No, the hell you will not. Uh, the cold is the rhinovirus. It's, it's caused by spit droplets from someone who has it. Your body temperature is, is quite irrelevant to cold. You cannot catch it by being cold. Although it looks, it feels, right? Because I'm like, well, I, I get cold-like things when I'm not bundled up. Anyway, your mother, well-intentioned as she is, is wrong. Um, I've, I skipped over my slide. Uh, I've been doing Linux since 1996. I was, I was part of the, uh, the Unix users group at BYU. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Matt Probst. He founded that a long, long time ago. Anyway, we were, we were doing T-Base, T-Base 2, T-Base T, T-Base 2. You know, the coax with the, uh, with the um, uh, you had to put a terminator on the end of the coax. Anyone remember? A long time ago. All right. Um, I think this is a good story. This, uh, you've heard this before, right? It's, it's uh, two hikers in the forest, and along comes a bear, and one hiker gets down and starts tying his shoes, and the other hiker says, you know, you cannot outrun a bear. Uh, to which the first hiker replies, I do not have to outrun the bear. I only have to outrun you, right? Pretty good. And a lot of people have, th have thought IT security is like that, that you just, they're, they're like, listen, just don't be like the dumb guy, or the easy target. As long as you're pretty good, uh, it, should be, it should be sufficient. The problem is the incremental cost for launching an attack approaches zero, meaning it doesn't cost them any more to attack your machines than it does attack everybody else. They're just port scanning, and as soon as they find someone, they will attack them. It costs them zero dollars. So you don't have to just be better than other people. You have to be, so not just good enough, but good security. Does that make sense? Uh, hopefully the, the analogy is, comes through. How much time do I have? 20 minutes, 30 minutes, some amount of time. I'm going to go. All right. Hours. Hours. Oh, yeah, here's me. Uh, so we have a global IT security team. 1,500 employees, uh, computer engineering, uh, uh, started as electrical engineering, uh, but then they changed the major on me. Uh, it used to be electrical engineering and computer science emphasis, and they, they came out with a computer engineering major, which is my major. I have an MBA from the University of Utah. Um, and I love this. This is my favorite quote. What's your job? Programming. What's your hobby? Programming. What do you do when you're not programming? I think about programming. That's, that's what I do. Um, so I've been married for seven years, and uh, in the basement, I, so I, I like um, uh, electronics, uh, you know, um, uh, Raspberry Pis, microcontrollers, you know, embedded systems, and uh, um, Arduino, things like that. And my wife came downstairs once, and I was building this little robot, and she's like, you love robots? I was like, yeah, I do. She's like, what do you love more, robots or me? And that's an important question, so I, I took a little moment to think about it. And the thing about women is that sometimes it's not just the answer, it's the delivery, and I thought too long. The answer was her, but I, I thought through it. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Peter Tippett, maybe you know Mr. Peter Tippett. He, uh, anyone remember Norton uh, Antivirus or Norton Utilities? He was one of the lead architects on that. Um, he also, he, he's, um, he was the author of the Verizon uh, DBIR. Has anyone, has anyone read the, the Verizon DBIR? Anyone know what I'm talking about? You should Google it. It's very important. Uh, basically, Verizon uh, gathers um, all of the statistics on, on uh, cyber breaches that occur and then summarizes that information and gives you a nice, um, very cleverly written um, summary of all those cyber attacks. Um, I think that's really interesting. A, it's written, it's actually pretty dang funny. You would think that the, the document would be like really serious because it comes from Verizon, but it is not. It's actually a hilarious read. Uh, this guy, super quirky, uh, he, he's written it for the last five years. Um, so I went to a lecture by him uh, a few months ago, and he said this. 
The exploits and security breaches which are technically feasible and the ones that actually occur are two very different things. So for example, we all, um, and part of, I don't know which PCI level you are, but one of the things they like you to tell, like you to assure is that you are uh, encrypting your data, they say both in transit and at rest, right? They love that. They're like, you gotta use HTTPS in transit, and then before you write it a disk, you should, you should encrypt it. And ostensibly you do this because a bad dude will like break into your Bluehost like physically breach the walls and steal your server, right? This never happens. In fact, it happens zero times over, uh, over all the breaches that Verizon, like no one ever like SWAT teamed in and busted down, bust down the wall and stole, stole a physical server. And yet we still do this, right? Um, so just because it would be possible to break into a data center, it would be possible to like break into the cages, literally wrench open the doors, no one actually does it. And so it's a little bit of security theater that we put you know, oh, I'm PCI compliant because I might encrypt my data at rest when data at rest is, is never physically stolen, right? Okay. Here's what we think we know, and this is, this is leading back to my, yes? When you say Verizon, like the Verizon phone company? Yes. And DBIR? DBIR, as in Delta, Bravo, Indigo, Romeo. Did I get that right? There's a slide on it. Okay. Yeah. Here's what we think we know. Oh, I'm gonna make fun of X. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say some non-flattering things about XKCD. Goodness, it would take 3.9 quintillion, which is an actual unit of time, years to brute force a 19-character alphanumeric password. So you should feel so good about that. You chose a long password. Surely it could never be it could never be cracked, right? Because you're hashing it in the database, and so you're good. We think that's true. XKCD says instead of choosing like random numbers and letters, choose words and just string a couple words together. And, and hit the one he comes up with is correct horse battery, uh, correct battery horse staple. Everyone ever seen the correct horse battery staple comic? Yes. And he talks about entropy, which sounds cool because it's like this physics thing and you're like, we should increase it. it. Sounds great to have lots of, and they're like, look how much entropy this has. You could never possibly crack correct horse battery staple. Right? It would take all those quintillion years. <sighs> Since I began administrating servers uh, in 96, um, uh, pretty much every, every like, root password until we got rid of root passwords and started using you know, um, SSH keys uh, had some sort of leet speak in it. Because right? the idea was no one will ever figure out that if we take the vowels and replace them with like, symbols, like it'll just be unhackable, right? P at dollar sign dollar sign, you know uh, that's the past part, and then W zero R D. It sounds cool. It's it's like hacksaw. No one ever figured it out, and it increases entropy. We all believe this. Best practice: better hash that thing, right? Because the idea is so hashes are one way crypt, uh, crypt, uh, cryptographic functions, and the idea is you can't go backwards, right? So you don't know. Um, so you you MD five it and. If you're really good, salt that thing, right? So, so tack some, tack some extra, a little bit of something on the end of that. Um, and then finally, a password, so long as it is, it is elaborate enough, is an adequate means of protecting data. And here are some basically uncrackable passwords. The mom of three great kids, the next best thing. Queds, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry to say that each of these is absolutely false, demonstrably false. And if you believe any of these things, um, maybe I can convince you that they're bad. Um, I don't know. This is, this is, you can take this poll later. Okay. We go through a few myths and then I'll talk about some of those assumptions that we've made um, and why they are not true. Uh, this is one we get a lot. Um, I'm a small organization. Like, I don't have anything of value. No one's going to hack me, right? So I shouldn't, I don't really have to invest very much in IT security, uh, I'm small potatoes, it doesn't really matter. Um, actually, the opposite is, is a fact. Oh, here it is again, the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, the DBIR. Um, they actually found that small businesses were even more of a tempting target because they knew that they didn't have any full-time IT security on staff, right? So um, uh, it's sort of the opposite of maybe of your, of your thinking. Um, 74% of small and medium-sized businesses reported a security breach. And then I talk about, I don't, I don't like the word cybersecurity because it sounds like something out of television or like a movies, but, or movies, but anyway. Um, 
because we're not just talking about infrastructure, we're talking about everything, I guess cybersecurity is. It is. Um, one, of the other, one of the other myths that we, we believe is that IT is a, is a tech, technology problem. So if you get a firewall, right? If you, go to, if you fly a lot, there's, there's always the Barracuda um, advertisements in, in the airports are like, you just need a firewall. You could just stop the bad guys from getting in. That'd be great. As it turns out, uh, um, uh, and, and, and the cool thing about the, the data breach investigations report, it'll actually tell you statistics about, about which, you know, what, uh, what vectors, you know, how people get into systems. Um, people are, are by far the, the biggest problem, right? Um, because, you, you know, uh, with, with social engineering or uh, we call it, you've probably heard of um, phishing emails or now they have spear phishing emails. The idea is it's no longer a Nigerian prince looking to, for your assistance to transfer some funds because of the, the collapse of a government. But now it's a, uh, hey, it's an, it's an email from, you know, you, you know maybe you're uh, a controller or an accountant at a company and you get an email from the, the president that says, hey, I need you to, uh, to wire this money. And it has to happen by 5 o'clock, so you better make it happen. I'm out of the office. Do the right thing. Here's the, here's the routing and, and account number. And you do it. Um, this actually, actually has occurred. You can read the story of uh, Stephen Downey where that, exactly, that actually happened. Um, and, 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 and more and more we're finding that, that targeted emails, you're only as good as your people. Um, if any, any, any of you watch Marcus Lemonis, is, um, he's, a, he's a show called uh, the, uh, the Prophet, P-H-I-T, not P-H-I-T, the other kind of prophet. Uh, he talks about people, process, and product. All three of those things need to be secure if your system is going to be secure, and people are the weakest link. Um, maybe we're, we are our own worst enemy. If you think about the password recovery questions, they're actually a, a great way to get into someone's account because almost invariably it asks you questions, and the answers are on social media, right? Like, you know. Um, What's your favorite place? Or what's your favorite kind of food? Well, listen, if you have Instagram, you've probably taken pictures of your favorite food a million times, right? And if you have Facebook, you probably went to your favorite place. Or where did you go to high school? That's also on, on your Facebook. So um, your, your, your answers are um, uh, a, great, a great insight into uh, what your, you know, how to reset your password. And in fact, uh, we're going to talk about the Adobe hack, which was really, which was awesome. This is actually something that XKCD got right, because Adobe had, had uh, not just password recovery questions, they had password hints. And the problem is they didn't do their hashing uh, correctly. And so all you had to do is line up all the hashes that matched with all the corresponding hints. And you had like, because it turns out people are not very good at choosing passwords, and so a lot of people chose the same password. If you had like 30 hints for the same, for the same password, <clears throat> after 30 hints, you're probably gonna get it right. Um, so this is something interesting. Uh, the CEO of Cloudflare was hacked. Uh, a lot of times, in order to re to to get um, like your your account like reset, you just have to have something know something personal, like your social security number. Um, and uh, they'll allow you to get you know I don't know if you've ever been on the phone with Comcast, but like you can guess numbers for a long time, right? There's no like three times and they'll hang up on you. You can keep you can keep going uh, until you eventually get it. Um, also, social security numbers are openly sold online, so um, you can you can buy them. Uh, maybe he, maybe you knew that there were lots. There was uh, last year a whole bunch of celebrity photos which were leaked, on, leaked online. Um, these were all spear phishing attacks. Um, people got a, a you know a, a legitimately looking email. It looks like it came from IT. Uh, it says, "Hey, you got to reset your password. Click here." As it turns out, people people click on those links all the time. So it's a huge problem. Um, it's not all about keeping the data secret. Um, has anyone ever been DDoS or had a denial of service attack against them? Anyone? Well, I have, and it was not very much fun. Um, so at Entrada, we do um, multifamily uh, housing software, meaning military housing, student housing, um, uh, affordable housing. So uh, these one of, the, one of the cool things about our software is you can pay your rent online, which is kind of cool as opposed to writing a check. We can just do a wire transfer. Um, people pay the rent online between the first and the fifth of every every month, which means we get a ton of traffic during that time. So our competitors thought it'd be clever if they would uh, send us a bunch of traffic uh, during the first through fifth, like a ton of traffic. So we were hosted at the time at Bio West, uh, and 
Uh, iOS will shut you off <laughs> if you're using more than, because um, it's, you know, it's a shared service. I get it, right? They have routers. And so all you have to do is overwhelm the router, which is like two gig, it's like a two gig connection. And then they'll shut it off and they'll turn off your IP address for like 48 hours, which is pretty bad if people are trying to pay rent online and they can't because you have, you've been shut off. Um, so, uh, so part of security is not just, um, you know, the confidentiality, but it's also, there, we have what's called the CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and the availability. And with a DDoS attack, um, you just, you simply deny availability. So, uh, alternately, you, with inte integrity, you can change the data. You don't have to just steal it and sell it. You can change it and you can affect the companies that way. Uh, this is awesome. I don't know if you've ever seen this. And I think, I think Macs are now, I've noticed now if I have, if I have something that I'm, I'm trying to cut and paste from a website into a terminal window and it has like a command or a carriage return in it, it'll actually uh, throw a little error now. It says, do you want to paste this even though it has a, uh, a carriage return? The idea is, um, so probably you want to do something, right? You're like, um, today, I wanted to know, so from a script server, I need to know uh, it's going to be natted through a public IP. I need to know what that IP address is, right? Uh, and so probably um, you're like, well, if links is on the box, I go to links and then Google, like, what's my IP? Turns out you can just curl, like, IP info slash, like, IP, right? And I'll tell you. Um, but I didn't know that offhand, but I knew how to get to it. So I Googled it, and there was the command. Well, with JavaScript, you can detect a highlight, and you can actually inject... Um, uh, I don't know if you ever cut and paste something from a web, website, and when you pasted it, it said it has all the attribution information. It says it came from this website. For more information, go, right? You're like, that's weird. I didn't cut that, right? But from JavaScript, they detected that, um, the highlight and the, you know, the command C, and then they injected stuff. The same thing can happen to like a Linux command. If you can imagine, I wanted to just highlight the curl command, but the web page, if they were malicious, they could have injected a bunch of information in that copy so that when I paste in the terminal window, they could run anything they wanted at whatever user I was you know, presently logged in at, right? So um, it's called paste jacking. Uh, and I'm surprised it's not more of a big deal. If you, I think it would be pretty, pretty simple uh, to pull this off, at least before. Um, I don't know if you guys use Macs, but Macs now guard against that. Here is... Here's how long it takes to crack um, passwords of a given entropy. Um, if you look, it says like, this is how many brute force guesses per second. Uh, and then somewhere in here, it's like 643 quadrillion years, 421 trillion years. So you, you should feel pretty good about, you know, 19 character passwords, except we don't use random passwords. Uh, hey, here, here's a slide where I quote myself, which is exciting. Um, first quote, two basic security misunderstandings are passwords are random, and the way in which password ha uh, hashes are cracked is random. Neither of those assumptions are true. Um, I think people are very terrible about, uh, maybe our mathematician can attest to this, we're very terrible about understanding what random is. Um, uh, we, we have this idea, maybe, and it makes because like in colloquial usage, we use the word random to mean things which uh, don't seem to be connected in some way. Maybe that's it. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so once upon a time, I was working at a company where um, we were getting, uh, so we, we, were, we were processing credit card orders and, and occasionally we were getting fraudulent credit card orders. And so my job was to, can I, de can I determine if the credit card order was fraudulent or not? Um, one of the things we asked for was email addresses. And so we did a bunch of um, analysis on the email addresses. And it turns out that, and you would think email addresses are kind of random-ish, right? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's more or less some letters, maybe some, uh, some numbers at some, some URL, right? Um, but but they're, really, they're really not. Almost, almost invariably, it has something to do with your first name or your last name. Um, and first name and last names, unless you're from Eastern Europe uh, and America, have you know, uh, um, patterns, right? We don't like runs of consonants. And so a great way to determine if an email address was an actual email address, or at least it would give you um, some indication that maybe you should look into it a little further, would be the number of consonants or the strings of consonants um, in, in an email address. Uh, it kind of gives you an idea of whether or not it's legitimate or not. 
Here's another one. Security costs money. It just costs money. Uh, I really think security is an economic, um, it's a marketplace. And so you have to pay. Uh, it just, you have to pay. You can either pay for backups, for example, or you can pay ransomware. Uh, you either pay bug bounties for people to find, um, you know, uh, vulnerabilities in your, in your SaaS system, or you're going to pay a PR firm when you do get hacked. And, you know, you have to go and say, oh, really sorry. We did some bad things. Um, and here's the terrible quote. As much as we might hope otherwise, we are not unique. Even if you were one in a billion, you would have six identical twins. Probably, and this is, this is hard hitting, probably you have never had a truly original idea. And, and if, you, if you've ever tried to register a domain name, you know that you have never had an original idea because some guy named John registered that same domain name 20 years ago, right? And you're like, how is that even possible? Well, it's possible because there's just a lot of people who are, are all thinking kind of the same thing. And what this leads to um, is that on any particular domain, uh, when people are asked to give a password, unless they're reusing the same password on every website, which half of us probably do, um, the, the, the passwords are not unique. And, and Adobe sh the Adobe sh hack showed us that people kept their clusters around the same password, the very same clever password. You know, a hundred people chose that very same password. Um, and if they're all hashed uh, in an identical fashion, and in which uh, and Adobe did not hash them, they, they two-way encrypted them. Terrible idea, but they did that. Uh, and they did it in such a way that the same password would two-way encrypt to the very same value. And so you could just compare those cryptographic values um, to know who had the same password. And again, because everyone had password hints, you now had 30 or 100 password hints at the same password and you could guess them. Hopefully you're not offended. I tried to get rid of my offensive slides. Um, here's what XKCD said. They said, look, uh, this is how you choose passwords. Um, and they said, if you take four random words, and you notice that they're counting entropy by the number of letters in the word. And so they're like, listen, if a computer has to uh, guess a password, and they have to guess it letter by letter, then you're right. It, this does have a ton of entropy. And it's easy for you to remember, right? Because you come up with this mnemonic device of, hey, that's a battery stable. Correct. Right? You can totally remember that. And if, if it were the case that um, hackers would guess letter by letter, you're right, this would be really good. But that would be ridiculous because it would take 643 quadrillion years. No one would ever do that, and so it's never done. No password longer than six characters is ever because it just takes too flipping long, right, uh, to guess it. And so um, what we do nowadays is we simply say, listen, if you're choosing four words, I'll choose four words, right? Your entropy just like collapsed immediately. And I can absolutely guess these sorts of passwords. So if all your passwords are four random words strung together, um, and I can show you how you can crack your own passwords in, in a moment, um, I think you're going to be surprised how easy it is uh, to crack passwords like this. Sorry, XKCD. Uh, I think I, here we go. Okay, here we go. Um, so the idea is that uh, you, need, you need to understand the patterns and, and, and people choose passwords because there's a conundrum, right? Because you want to be random. Everyone wants to be random and, and passwords have a little meter, right? They're like, you got you to have, you, what's your complexity? You don't want to be medium. You want to be super complex. And they, you ever wonder how they do that, right? They're, they're literally, you know, they're, they're counting like, well, it's super complex if it has like a symbol in it, uppercase and lowercase, and it's a certain length, right? Boom, you just pass the complexity. The problem is, you have to, on one, on one hand, you're trying to feel good about the password complexity, but then on another, you've got to remember this password. And so there's got to be something about it that's memorable. And therein is, is the way you exploit um, uh, passwords. If it's memorable to you, what you're really saying is there's some sort of pattern, right? And so passwords almost invariably follow a pattern, right? Oftentimes it's a string of, word, a string of letters followed by some numbers followed by some symbols. And you know this because, um, when, when sites get hacked, they publish, almost, almost, uh, almost always they'll publish all the cracked passwords. And so you know, oh look, everyone else is choosing password 7743 exclamation mark, oh crap, I need a capital letter, capitalized P, right? So things, you, you'll find these uh, repeatable patterns and passwords. And so uh, if you want to crack a password, you certainly do not start, you certainly do not just start putting random letters and numbers together. Instead, you got to get uh, some word dictionaries. And so what do you do? 
you you write some crawlers and some some really good word dictionaries actually come out of the comment section of YouTube. Has anyone ever read the comment section of YouTube? It's like I think the only thing worse is maybe the comment section of like KSL. Um, it's sort of uh, the worst of humanity uh, comments on on YouTube and, and KSL. Um, uh, but the point is that they the cool thing about comments is it's very conversational, right? And so you have a lot of slang words and a lot of words that uh, you might you would you might not you know think of if you were writing a like a more polished piece, but they're great. It, it's a great like seed um, for dictionary attacks. Um, good, good. Okay, and so uh, the, the the software program <coughs> you should download is Hashcat. Anyone know about Hashcat? It's pretty awesome. Um, uh, and what Hashcat does is it starts out with word lists, so you still need word lists, and so you're going to get word lists from uh, a variety of places, like I said, from uh, places like Wikipedia or Project Gutenberg, uh, which is like scanned in books, right, that they did OCR on, uh, and, and YouTube. But then you're going to apply, apply rules to these, or like permutations to these, these word lists. Uh, they've got about, I think that Hashcat has about 5,100 different rules. And so one of the rules is like the Haxor rule, right? Where they're like, hey, I'm going to replace all the vowels with you know, symbols that look like them. A dollar sign looks an awful like an S. An at sign looks like an A, etc. cetera. Um, so they'll take all these word lists, apply these rules, and, see if you're, and then they'll hash it and see if your password um, uh, matches. And the cool thing about all of this is that people still use MD5. And um, probably because it's just widely available. It's right there on the Linux command line. MD5 sum, super easy to get to. Problem is it's really, really, really fast to compute an MD5. Super fast. My laptop can compute, I don't know, it's like 600 billion MD5s in a second. Um, that's a lot of MD5s. Um, yours can probably do it. If you have a GP, if you have a, you know, uh, maybe you have a, like a Bitcoin miner, you got a bunch of GPUs, you can probably compute like trillions of, of MD5 hashes in, in one second. Um, so here, here this talks about, um, again, the, the whole part of this is that you're reducing the key space, right? or, or really the, the actual entropy, and you're, you're doing this by um, uh, applying these rules. And so um, Hashcat has tons of rules. You can download the rule sets, and you can, you can download all of the, um, every time you know, a major site gets cracked, they'll release the, the passwords. People reuse the same passwords again and again and again because it's hard to remember complex passwords. And so you probably have like one that you use for your bank and another that you use for like everything else. And the problem is <laughs> that everything else was probably cracked like two years ago. Um, there's been, there have been so many um, uh, security breaches, particularly in 2015. Yeah? Does it make a significant difference with an MD5 hash if you were to have a long salt? Uh, no, it does not. Um, uh, particularly if it's static salt. Uh, because it, uh, so. Um, a great way to do this is if you knew what the salt was, and probably the salt's like in the database table itself, you can generate a rainbow table, which is all possibilities of, of you know, um, values up, you know, like 30 characters or, or longer with that salt appended on, uh, and you can generate these in a matter of hours. Um, and, and then it's just, uh, it's a big O1 complexity lookup, right? It's just, what's that hash? Boom, look it up, immediately have it. So it, it, doesn't, it does not help. You should stop using MD5 because it's so fast. You need to find a cryptographic hash function that's slow, and 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 what you should even what you should do even more, and I talk about it here in a moment, is every year you should probably think, okay, my, my computing, right? We have we, we know that computing power <coughs> keeps doubling every 18 or so months. You need to you need to um, uh, uh, come up with ways to make that cryptographic function even sl uh, slower every year as computing power increases. You can talk. You can. Uh, I talk about some of the attacks that they use um, in Hashcat. If you haven't used it, I 5,120 rules, um, and these these are actual passwords that you can crack, like Mama Three Great Kids. Uh, it turns out that um, a lot of people choose passwords with patterns like that, and they're very crackable. Um, so if you had accounts on LinkedIn or Yahoo or Gawker, or eHarmony or Ashley Madison, I know, probably a few of you. Um, all those passwords are of, of freely available right now. So if you have not changed your password like, freq like recently, uh, you can go look up your password. It's just online. You can just look it up. 
So and also, if your if your Google account has ya your Yahoo email as your backup. Oh sure, yeah, that, that's right. That's yeah, a problem. yeah, that is a problem. Uh, forty nine percent of people apparently reused um, passwords. Um, and here's some stats using a single graphics card. How long did you know did it take to um, to crack? Uh, and you can do this. You can you can actually download like the MD5 version of the of the you know like the Etsy, Etsy password D file. You can download that from a lot of these um, uh, attacks, and you can run uh, Hashcat against it. This this particular guy took 20 hours, and he got a 90% success rate. And here are some of the passwords he cracked which you would probably think would be impossible, right? Because the passwords are so long and they seem complex. Um, uh, and, and, and that's with GPUs. Of course, as soon as we start going to like FPGAs or ASICs, I mean, you're, 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 it's like trillions of MD5s a second, <coughs> like, like literally. So um, stop using MD5. Uh, on the other hand, using uh, slower um, one break, um well, uh, hashing functions. Um, it looks like this particular one, SSJ512, you get about 2,000 guesses per second. That's way better than thing, 600 trillion. One of the ones you mentioned there at the end, S-Script. Yeah. I believe S-Script is a memory hard um, hashing. Yeah. So it's very difficult to, like a lot of them use a pipelining system to yeah. make it faster to, when they're cracking. But because it uses memory and, and stuff, it that, can't. That's absolutely right. So that's what you want. You want it. You want it to be. Make it faster. Absolutely, and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something that's computationally intensive, because right. that what that what you're really saying is it costs money, right? Well, the, the thing is computationally expensive, but also memory. Computation speed is increasing faster than memory. Yeah. So make it take so more memory as well. Memory. So if you. That's awesome. If you use a memory hard. Than it takes long. Yeah, so I have bcrypt, scrypt, and pkbdf2 yeah, as well. Um, it's not just the memory, or just that, but, but in order to use the GPU, you have to uh, have have things that fit in a small amount of memory. Yeah. To parallelize, and so if you have so scrypt because it uses a whole lot of memory, you can't fit into GPU very easily. Yeah, I love it. Um, this talks about like the, in general how you go about uh, hacking passwords. The first thing you do is you're like, well, maybe someone has a short password. And so you can go through uh, the first six combinations. It takes about five minutes to guess all possible, uh, try all possible combinations of like six letters. Uh, after that, you stop that because you're like, eh, it actually goes up super dramatically. Like to get passwords that are seven, eight, nine. I don't know if you ever, anyone's ever tried to reverse engineer uh, Windows passwords, which used to be MD5. I don't know if they do that any, anymore, but it used to be MD5. Um, again, if it's longer than six, it, it goes from like minutes to you know, weeks, right? And as soon as you, as soon as you hit weeks, you've lost me. Like, I'm not interested in cracking anymore. Um, and then it talks about that. That's when you transition out of, way, out of the way from brute force attacks to um, looking for patterns. Um, and then there's that, there's that interesting thing that even though people don't get together and select passwords, for any particular site, you're going to find that um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of people choose the same passwords. So a curious, a curious uh, artifact. Um, okay. So again, we're we're talking again about uh, how to make a slow hash function. Um, th this is a this is an unintended side effect of having a slow hash function. Uh, so back in the days when we were DDoS, um, they actually were hitting. They tried lots of different DDoS attacks, but one of the one they tr one of the ones they tried at the end was actually. Uh, a level, a uh, layer seven, so HTTP, and they were hitting our our search page, right? Um, and the idea was they thought that and it was actually pretty good. Uh, they're like, this is a slow page. It's probably uh, there's probably a lot of resources that return search results. Um, in our system, there were a lot of resources, and so it didn't take very many parallel requests to that search page to make our servers run really slowly. Um, uh, if if you have a very very slow hashing algorithm. It could be that your login page is slow, right? If it takes several seconds to do a hash, uh, it might be a point for, for DDoS. And so you may have to uh, throw in the annoying captures. I know we hate captures, but there ain't, ain't nothing like slowing down a, either a bot or a DDoS than you know, throw a captcha in there. 
Um, and now Google does a, a great captcha. You know, find all the places, click all the images that have a duck in them. Although now we're getting to the point, Stanford has some great tools that can tell you all those images that have ducks in them. So take that, Google. Um, Google just has you click, check a box. You know. So, sometimes there's check a box. Um, their, their next iteration is invisible, so you don't even see it. Oh, is that right? They just know. Oh, great. That's awesome. Well, it'll show up if it thinks you're not a robot. Or if it thinks you are a robot, uh -huh. then it'll show something. Oh, that's awesome. But if it's pretty sure you're not, it doesn't want to show your mouse movements. Yeah. <coughs> So um, a lot of the slow cryptographic functions, they have an iteration count. And the idea is that you could increase that iteration count as the years uh, go to make it, um, you know, this year, maybe the right number is 2,000. Maybe in, 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 in uh, next year it's 4,000. So you increase it again uh, in, in response to um, uh, computation, computational increases. Um, here are some specifics. These are all published online. I can, I can share this with you. It's actually on the Open West site. This is my little stab at Max. People are like, Max, don't get viruses. The hell they don't. Um, OK, so this is what I'm going to talk about, uh, multi-factor authentication. So the cool thing, multi the cool thing about multi-factor authentication is it, it is a great remedy for people, right? Because people are going to be people, and they're going to use the same password on a million different sites. And those sites, they're going to get hacked. And then what are you going to do about it? I'll tell you what you're going to do about it. You're going to require multi-factor authentication. Um, pretty much every site nowadays uh, supports it. Um, Google Ops for Business, Facebook, LinkedIn, they all do it. You should, if you, if, uh, if my recommendation that if you administer systems, you should require it. Um, so the idea uh, about either two-factor or more than two-factor authentication is you need some other token. Back in the day, we used to carry the little uh, RSA key fobs. Anyone remember those? Had a number that would change on it. They were like expen they're like $100. But now it's just an app. Um, app's a little less awesome, uh, only because um, AT&T, if you call them, if you can guess their security, uh, security answers, they can forward the AT&T uh, number to any cell phone you want. And so if you're using, if some, you're like, yeah, send me a text message with uh, my two-factor authentication, you call up, thank you, Facebook, I now have, I've now sent your text messages to my phone, I can get in. So not as cool, but anyway, those fobs are expensive. Um, I, like, I like this one, so don't you reuse passwords. It's so hard because there's so many flipping sites, right? You're on every single site and every, every site wants you to choose a new username or password or log in with, log in with Facebook using OAuth. It always makes me like nervous because they're like, we're going to, you know, do you want to grant this application rights to like post? No, I do not want to do that. Um, but yeah, um, sometimes password managers, if, if they're actually doing a good job of encrypting those passwords can be a, um, a solution to this. I like giving bogus answers to security questions um, because then it's like a secondary password that only you know that protects your password. So maybe, maybe consider uh, doing that. So what's my first car? It was a camper van, Beethoven freaking rules. Because no one's going to guess that. It's not on Facebook. It's not on uh, Instagram. I like this one. Man, maybe now is the time to shut down some of those social media accounts if they have lots of personal information about them. Um, I just had a, uh, um, a child. And that's one of the first things they tell you at the hospital is maybe don't post all that stuff online. Um, uh, stealing babies like social security numbers and and you know signing up new credit cards for babies is apparently a popular thing to do um and then yeah maybe you have there's a secure email address for password recoveries maybe you don't use your yahoo account for password uh, recoveries so this is interesting probably nsa is recording this conversation or i know we're recording this conversation um i don't i don't love that idea right it's the idea that if you have nothing to hide, then it doesn't matter who's, you know, who's uh, reading information. I don't, I don't love that. Um, and, and it's particularly the case that um, we're, we're, let's talk about PCI, right? So PCI only, it's payment card industry, only, they only care about credit cards, which is really curious to me. They only care about credit cards. They do not care about how you store, like, um, banking, uh, like, routing and account numbers. Let's just all agree that's ridiculous. Not just a little bit ridiculous, it's incredibly ridiculous that they don't care. 
right? Because um, credit card, everyone's so concerned about credit cards, but they have really good fraud prevention, right? Like if your credit card's been stolen, maybe they got like one or two purchases before that thing was shut down. And it, how much did it cost you? Zero. It didn't cost you a thing because they found it, they stopped it. Because people do, you know, as it turns out, um, bad dudes are pretty predictable too. What do they do? They first go to the gas station and they pump like a dollar of gas. And then they go to Amazon and they try to buy something big, right? So these are, these are recognizable patterns. So as it turns out, uh, credit card information is not very valuable. You know what really is valuable? Things like loan application uh, data, right? No one cares about loan application data. There's no like loan application data uh, provider that's going to say, you've got to encrypt that stuff. And so a lot of times, it's just in a database somewhere, right? And so that app you wrote you know, for, for a few thousand dollars to the, to the, for the car dealership down the street, that stuff's just sitting in a MySQL database. And when they get hacked, now I can impersonate you. Now I can open 1,000 credit cards in your name, right? It's way more valuable, but yet we care about it way less, ironically, I think. I think you had a comment? Yeah. Well, the same thing if you work through PCI thing. Yeah. And uh, we tokenize, so we really reduce scope. We'll come yeah. to find out the uh, alarm system, is what my our company does. Yeah. You have to qualify with the credit check. Yeah. Well, the, all three credit bureaus were sending full account numbers to us. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it has their address, everything in there. And they were just storing those plain text. Yeah. You know, that, was, that was implemented. Nobody cares about it. They only care about credit card information. Yeah, and really, we yeah. did take the credit card information out. We, we actually we got on with each of them, and they totally wiped. They scrubbed the account numbers for us now. We don't ever see them. Hmm. But uh, the one that's like, I worked here for five years, and you were the only person that was ever asked to have that information taken out. Like, how does anybody else pass PCI? Yeah, it, it blows my mind. So I'm glad you talked about tokenization. We need to cover. <laughs> have any time? I'm, I'm probably, I don't know what time. I'll wrap up here shortly. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, tokenization is important um, because it shifts liability, right? The, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a moment. But the other part is what, what I think is is um, uh, super critical, and that's the idea of data. So I don't know who thought a long time ago people were like, we should just collect as much data as possible. Well, here's the thing. I think this is, this is critical. If your data does not have an immediate business purpose, it's a liability. It's not an asset. It's really important, right? People collect information that they, they don't need, uh, and then they, they, you know, so in our industry, for example, if you've ever lived in student housing, you fill out a bunch of, bunch of stuff right, as an application. Uh, so we delete that information, because otherwise, can you imagine me coming to you and be like, hey, remember how you applied for that student housing, like, you know, 10 years ago? We got hacked, and your information was stolen, and now, right? So it's like, uh, but we just don't think about, like, should we delete that? Um, so you ought to sort of survey the information that you're, you're collecting and ask, uh, question like, do we need this? Like, are we required by law to keep this? If we're not, we should probably delete it. You don't need it. Uh, it's a liability. Um, and, and by that I mean, literally, there are um, uh, there's there's no like federal uh, single federal um, uh, group of laws about what you do in, in case of uh, a cyber attack uh, breach. But uh, every state has has disclosure laws, um, and so you're going to get fined based on the number of records that that are released. Um, you know, uh, into the wild. And so, you know, uh, you can take like a $10 million breach and, and, and maybe it's only a million dollars, which maybe they're the same number to you, but there's a difference just by deleting records that you do not need uh, for your database. So, great. Um, cryptocurrency. I will tell you this, um, that it's interesting to me that ransomware, has anyone, anyone had ransomware in, the, in your company? You get an email, someone clicks on it, and then... It finds your, you know, your network shares and encrypts the heck out of it. And then they're like, hey, you just got to pay your $179 and we will decrypt it for you. Uh, question you're probably asking, do they actually decrypt it? The answer is yes. Yes, they absolutely will. Uh, it's part of their business model. Can you imagine if they didn't? Then no one would pay. So they have to decrypt. So they will decrypt your data. That is great news. And they actually, do, they're like, listen, we're just programmers that we're programming. And so, you know, they kind of see themselves as legitimate businessmen. Um, uh, so it is nice you can get your data back. Um, uh, I, guess, I, I guess the point is, and, and because of cryptocurrency, right, how are you going to trace Bitcoin? You're not, right? They have your money. Thank you for playing. Um, and it's kind of, maybe it's just the cost of, of not having backups in place or not having adequate cybersecurity. Uh, and it, it's a really good business model. Um, that's a return on investment. 
1400%. Um, and then it talks about you, you need to get a valid decryption key or the business model doesn't work. So, uh, And guess what? Everyone pays, by the way. It's like 80% of the people pay. Got to get your data. So, uh, Look at the DBIR. It's important. Um, here's what Peter said when I talked to him. Uh, longer passwords don't make you more, sec more secure. He, people have these crazy long passwords and like, man, I'm... I'm a, an amazing hacker. Look at this awesome password I have. Um, uh, that kind of stuff doesn't doesn't work. With I mean, keyloggers don't care if you have a five digit or five alphanumeric characters or 100. They're just going to log it. Um, almost always, uh, Peter says the data shows that breaches come from stolen passwords, not cracked passwords. And then he talks about risk um, and threat. Um, and this is important. I'll, here's a little formula about how to calculate risk. Um, a lot of people confuse uh, risk um, and vulnerability or impact, and, and risk is related to threat. It takes a second to, uh, but here's, here's an example. If a meteor hits your house, it'll kill you. Uh, the impact is infinite, but the threat is zero, so you don't focus on meteor protection around your house. That's important. It's better to apply secure patches more thoroughly. And this is, this is something that, that he fi finds. Uh, the zero-day exploits... Um, they have like no impact, right? It's the it's the Linux systems that you forgot about. I mean, so I manage I don't know probably 700 Linux machines. Um, like, are they all patched? Well, I hope so, right? But you probably have. We just moved buildings. We found servers no one knew about, right? <laughs> and you're like, how in the world, right? There's there's stories of people like moving. They find like a Cat5 cable going into a wall. You're like, what the heck is this? And you bust open the wall, and someone had walled off, like, and there's servers in there that have just been running. That's Linux, right? It'll just run forever. Um, so anyway, um, so you need to apply the security patches, but probably don't be, um, uh, you know, so don't be so erratic about patching them. In 2014, almost 100% had been disclosed for more than a year before they were um, it's for their use. So these are just guys that just never got around to applying patches in a timely manner. There's your encrypting data and rest. It doesn't, it's help. I hope there's not any IDS or IPS systems. People in this company, or in the in present company, they're largely ineffective. Um, uh, they, they just that they consistently fail to block attacks. Um, and there's the attack vector. It's people. 77% of computers are infected via email attachments. People click on links. Um, here's some other things. Use multi-factor authentication. Don't say dumb things in email. People are using email more and more. They hack your system, they immediately get into your email because that's where I mean, we store all of our business intelligence in email. So your email is sometimes more, uh, it talks about company strategy, it can be more valuable than, uh, than, than everything else. We're so concerned about credit cards, but they're actually the least of your concerns. Uh, all the Sony stuff um, showed that they, sold, they said terrible things about their customers and their employees and probably don't do that. Network segmentation, um, uh, that Home Depot and or Target in particular was really terrible about that. About that. Uh, it was actually a, it was an H HVAC vendor who got into their system because they just didn't segment their network. That's a problem. Um, also, Sony didn't know that people were streaming out like ter terabytes of information out of their system. They had no... Uh, egress monitoring, which is crazy that like Sony wouldn't know that. Here's the Adobe. It's called like the best game ever. They had uh, here's the the password hints, uh, um, and literally, it's the numbers one two three four five six. It's like that's their hint, right? That's those are not very good hints. Um, XKCD said it's like the greatest crossword puzzle in the history of the world is the Adobe hack. Uh, has anyone hacked? Here are all the big companies have been hacked uh, recently, and like these are big companies. Um, and there's probably more because if you're if uh, you can, if the company doesn't can't prove that records were released, they don't have to re report it, right? So there's probably chronic underreporting. And uh, here is here is a takeaway. Maybe I'll end on this. Uh, breaches don't come from. We have this idea that that cyber Criminals are, they're like Russians, right? Because Russians are super smart, I guess, or Ukrainians. And they're, they're like a warehouse or their parents' basement. I don't know where they are, but they're surrounded by like, I don't know, like Commodore 32s or whatever. Green text is scrolling, and they're like super smart. They're like, I got this. It's Linux. And they're, they're going at it. Um, so this is, this is a screenshot from 
a, uh, a, France, a French um, newscast. Um, this is a reporter. Behind the reporter printed are all their social media usernames and passwords. Um, the next day it was like news across the country. Major television station hacked. And it's like, you weren't really hacked. You were just, I mean, dumb. Right? That's like, maybe don't do that. That's not bright. That's not hacking. That's, that's just simple user failures, right? Um, everybody, Jay, and, and he, uh, he tried this. He, um, his domain name, he registered a domain name that was confusingly similar to his company's domain name, and then he sent out this. Uh, he says, hey, here's a new cybersecurity document. Click the link. And it, that sent you to a Google Doc, a Google Form. And the first thing it asked for was your your Google username and password. And he had about, I think I want to, I think I want to say like 70% of his company entered their Gmail username and password in response to this. He said, don't do that. He waited a year. Here it was. He waited a year, uh, and he, I think I have it in here. Do I have it? Maybe I don't. Uh, he waited a year, and then he sent out another one uh, from the same domain name. He's like, guys, this wasn't even our domain name. Uh, and this time it was like, hey, you got to fill this out in order to, w uh, to win some Justin Bieber tickets. And he had like 80% of his company typed in their Gmail username and passwords. Mm -hmm. A lot of believers out there. Here's some important things. Encrypted data. The idea is um, you want the data to be not useful if they do get it, right? So it's, it's kind of reducing the potential impact. Uh, map your data. Um, uh, anyway, you can read through this. Call is, is in particular, particularly important. That means delete it if, you're not, if you don't have a, um, a, um, a use for it. And then I love the developer response plan. So if you were to get a hack today, what are you going to do about it? Like, what's your, what's, like you shouldn't be thinking about, man, uh, should we engage a law firm? Like you, you should have thought of that ahead of time. And hopefully you have someone that you've you know, contacted or maybe someone on retainer or something. Um, you need to know what the applicable laws are. And you should go through this instant response plan you know, annually. Have a little mock you know, um, uh, cybersecurity breach and get, get together important people and just kind of go through. You don't, you, don't, you don't, this is not the time to be like, hey, should the CEO be involved? Like, who should be involved? Or are we going to do our own forensics? Are we going to dive in like CSI? Stop it. Like, like, figure that stuff out before it happens and then kind of run through it. Wrap it up. Slow salted hash. Man, I hope we start protecting banking information and all the other information that PCI doesn't care about. Uh, I like third party audits. PCI is good. I like SOC 1, SOC 2. Um, we, there are some, there are some, we kind of have to steal from other industries. Um, like, you know, um, the banking industry has like some socks. There's, there's some, there's some uh, applicable, SOC 1 and SOC 2 come from accounting, for example. Uh, and then use um, two-factor authentication. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions, comments for me? Here's some things you can do, by the way. Uh, if you don't use multi-factor multi authentication, I plead with you to please start using it. Um, like I say, it covers up a host of sins that maybe you're, maybe you're engaging in. Uh, stop using any shared passwords. Um, and this is, so one of the things they found in Sony is they literally, on their shared drive, they found a list of system passwords. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, box, here's, the, here's this server, here's the root password. Here's this server, here's the root password. Come on, guys! Like that's that's terrible, right? It's terrible for Sony to do it. Um, it also makes it makes it you know it's it's not it's not super bright Russian hackers. It's just you know not following security best best practices. Um, and then yeah, have a have an incident response plan and test it. So yes, uh, I I worked at a place that required you to change your password every three months. Yeah. Um, so people would change it, change one letter, whatever. Yeah, oftentimes you put an incrementing number on the end. Is that what everyone does? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's so much around. security. Thank right. you for making me do that. Right. Yeah. But the other side of that is they say, don't write down your password. Yeah. How in the world are you supposed to remember this? Yeah. It's, it's a, a two-edged sword. I mean, you're, they're making it almost impossible. It's very true. At the same time. Yeah. Uh, so multi-factor authentication helps with that because people invariably will, I mean, they're, they're, you got to remember the system, so either you're using a password manager, and some of them are pretty good. They use some pretty good encryption. Uh, they require you to provide, they'll actually encrypt with the token that you, there's like a passphrase that they use to encrypt, meaning the company itself doesn't know the password because you, uh, you provided the token from which they, uh, they're encrypting it on. 
Um, that, that helps, although if the software itself is breached, they could, they could, and you're typing it, so they could potentially get it. Um, but the cool about thing about multi-factor is even if you are adding letter or it's a little bit security theater, right? Uh, or, or incrementing, um, because they require that unique token each time, uh, it, it sort of stops the, um, the, the potential impact of a cracked uh, password. So it's well-intentioned people, but it's a hard problem to keep things secure at the, at, the, at the same time as there's so many systems. I think we did an audit on our company. I think we're using 3,000 <coughs> vendors. So 3,000 SaaS products we use at, at Entrada. All of those have username and passwords. What about biometrics, They're like fingerprints? Or yeah, so multi-factor, uh, the idea is something you know, something you have, something, uh, uh, you know, like it's, it's, it's different attributes of you. So um, the, if you could use like a fingerprint scan or, or something like that, that's as many factors as possible uh, really makes things, things secure. It's, it's, it's a combination of, of them. Um, I like, I would, so, so yeah, I, I, like, I like that idea. But not, not by itself, but when combined with, you know, say a, a random token and something you know. That you wrote down. Um, potentially you wrote down, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Any other questions for me? Say so for our PCI, they said you could write them down, just don't leave them in sticky notes. No sticky notes. They can be in a file in a shared folder. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't. Stop that. So. Anyway, I guess my hope is that um, probably, hopefully, some of you guys are doing some of these things. You're like, yeah, we've got, we, we're doing that. We're, we're allowing, we're not using SH keys or we're not using multi-factor authentication. We should probably do that. Because there's always this conflict, right, between um, the, you know, the, Accessibility or the ease of use and security, right? They're they're in, they're in conflict, and it's also hard hard to get executive buy-in on some of these things. You're like, what? I got to set up two-factor. That's just so irritating. Why can't I just use username and password? Or I don't want to change my password. Or what's wrong with horse staple battery? Um, so there's a lot of kind of changing hearts and minds as as we go through you know security. So anyway, that's all I got. Thanks, guys. <laughs>